What's up everybody? Welcome to Urban Crest Online. It is so great to have you with us again today as we continue to go deeper into how we got the Bible that we have today. So Pastor Tom is going to open all of that up for us. It's going to be amazing. So that means you need to open up your Urban Crest app do it right now. Get those notes ready because you can go line by line, block by block with him and uh, and really, really soak up a lot of the knowledge that he has to bring. But before we get into the word, how about we ready our hearts in worship? That means we're going to stand right where we are and we're going to sing some songs that we know and that we love and we're going to give them right to God. What an amazing gift that we are even able to do that. So I hope you're ready because I'm ready. Let's go. Church, right where you are, put your hands together with us. Come on. He is worthy of our worship, and he's the reason for our joy. Let's go. Jesus, there is nothing like your presence. I will sing of all your goodness, where all my fears pay to pray. Thank you. 
whatever situation we're in, we have comfort in the fact that you have already won every battle, and we trust you. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus.
G'day Urban Chris, so great to have you with us today. I trust you've been encouraged as I am always encouraged by our worship and I'm so looking forward to Pastor Tom and the word that he's about to bring in a moment. But I want to focus just for a moment as we are going through our 21 days of prayer and fasting to remind you if you haven't already started, now is a great time to start. And if you have started, I trust that you're being encouraged as you're looking through these devotions. As you know, there are many things to be praying about. And I want to encourage you each day just to take that five or ten minutes that you might get before the Lord. But I'm going to ask you now, if you would just join with us as we pray, obviously for all that's going on in the country, all that's going on here, and also for all that's going on in families. So let's just pray. Dear Lord and gracious Father, how we thank you that you are sovereign of all, that you are Lord over all and you are Lord of all. And for Lord, thank you for all that's going on now. Nothing is taking you by surprise. Lord, we pray for this nation with all that's going on. And Lord, we find that we would find unity in Christ, that we would find common ground and that we would encourage one another. Lord, for all that's going on in Urban Crest, how I thank you for each and every person. Father, there are some who are unwell, how we lift them up. Lord, there's some who are struggling, how we pray for those and Lord for our community that we as Urban Crest would be your hands and your feet to reach this community and Lord for individuals and for families how we just pray that Lord you would continue to encourage them and to keep them and to bless them and to use them for your glory Lord how we thank you for the tremendous privilege we have of coming before you and being able to pray one for another Lord we thank you and we commit these things to you in Jesus name Amen. Hey, thanks for being with us and God bless you. Well, good morning again, Urban Crest Baptist Church. If you got your Bibles, turn to the book of Acts. We're going to continue our study on how we got the Bible. And we've been doing just a general survey of Scripture, an Old Testament survey, now a New Testament survey talking about the main themes, which the main theme is always the main theme. His name is Jesus. And every book of the Bible focuses on the man called Jesus Christ and redemption that is found in God and God alone. In Acts chapter 1, and uh, one of the great passages of Scripture, tells us why the book of Acts was written. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. It's an interesting thing here. When two infinitives are together, the second is always for emphasis. We always want to talk about the miracles of Jesus, not sometimes focus on the teaching of Jesus. There's never a miracle in the Bible without a message behind it. So that's the important thing for us to understand. And right off the bat, he says, this is why we, we wrote the former account which I, I made, and again, talking about the Gospel of Luke, unto the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. When we move down in that chapter in verse 8, we have the great commission by Jesus himself for us to take the gospel. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the biblical message that Jesus saves is found in every book of the Bible. So let's start back up with the uh, book of Acts. Uh, we talked about the the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, being uh, not only what we call Gospels and good news, but they're also historical books. Uh, Luke himself is a historian writing them. So we get a lot of our early church history. We get all of our history about the life of Christ many times from those accounts. Now, I want to make sure we also understand 
when we talk about that and we talk about this man called Jesus, the, only, the accounts of Jesus' life are not just found in what we would call Christian literature. When you talk about the resurrection, there are some 38 other sources, outside sources, separate from God's word that confirm this man Jesus and that he was crucified. Something strange happened surrounding his death. So understand, there is a lot of external proof to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, a Son of God as well as the Bible to prove it also. So let's talk about the history of the Christian church and continue with the book of Acts. It talks about the beginning, uh, the spread of the Christian church. It uh, could be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit and was written as an evangelical tool for you and I to use to take this gospel message out and share it with others. Uh, Dr. Johnny Hunt, who has preached at our church a couple of different times at our men's summit, probably gave the best outline of the book of Acts I think I've ever heard when he gave this simple illustration in, chap uh, in Acts chapter 1. Um, the Savior goes up in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit comes down, and in Acts chapter 2, the saints then go out. Savior up, Spirit down, saints go out. Should be the replica of the church today, but tragically, many times we sit and ask people to come join us versus going out there where people at and telling them about the man called Jesus. And then we have uh, little letters uh, written. We call them epistles. They're uh, a small letter, some of them today we'd call an email or a blog post. I mean, you get to Second John or Third John, some of these Philemon, some of these small books. They're 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 very short, but they've got a tremendous uh, biblical message behind them. These books were written in your notes to individuals, to churches, to believers in general. The letters deal with every aspect of Christian faith and Christian responsibility. Paul uh, is the author of the overwhelming majority of them. Uh, Paul would start out, and if we're doing the biblical order as we get them, not the order that they were actually written, but the biblical order, we have them in what we call the Bible today. You have the book of Romans. And in the book of Romans, Paul summarizes the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. And man, I mean, writing to Rome, he shows this man called Jesus is truly God's son in the gospel presented in there. It's interesting his emphasis that Paul uh, starts out with in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, he begins to talk about the heathen and uh, those that don't know God or have practices that are contrary to God's word. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a pretty intense chapter in Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 2, he starts talking about the hypocrites that are out there. And man, and listen, if you're reading this book, oh yeah, them heathen people, sure, man. I mean, that you get chapter, oh, that's right, ever the hypocrites, everybody's a hypocrite out there and all this kind of stuff. Well, in chapter three, he starts turning the screws a little more, and then he starts talking about the Hebrew people and showing that they need a savior just as bad as the heathen and the hypocrite. And by the time you hit Romans chapter three, verse twenty three, all of humanity is lost and is in need of a savior. And from that point on. He talks about this man, Jesus, and how Jesus came to save us from our sins. He sets it up perfectly. He paints this scenario that is just beautiful. And I love the writings of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul writes to the city of Corinth the first time. He had actually written them a letter previously. And for whatever reason, this letter had been destroyed. We have no record of it as far as uh, what the contents of it were. He just acknowledges that fact. He writes to them now in what we call 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Paul says this, now concerning the things you wrote me about. So they had written him a letter with questions about, man, listen, we're living in this culture now, all kinds of different things. And what about this? And what about that? So Paul begins to write back to answer their questions. But before he starts answering their questions, he really uh, gets to the core of the matter, and that's the first six, six chapters. Corinth uh, had uh, all kinds of issues as a church. And so he writes a discipline letter to Corinth, and he tells them how Christians ought to behave. And I mean, it's it's a pretty stinging letter. Now, the good news about it, I mean, it, it's a tough letter. I mean, in First uh, Corinthians chapter 5, 
Paul turns a guy over who is committing gross immoral sin. The church is bragging about it. He turns this guy over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. I mean, gee whiz, it doesn't get much worse than that. Can you imagine? But here's the good news of the gospel. Corinth gets right with God. I mean, he gets right with God. This guy that Paul, I mean, listen, if Paul turned you over to Satan, you're either going to repent or you're going to die. One of the two, this guy got right with God. Now, church in typical fashion, he wouldn't let the guy come back. <laughs> they kicked the guy out and said, no way, Jose, we don't want to be anywhere around you. Paul writes a second time, says, let the guy come back. He's actually confessed his sins. His life has changed. His lifestyle has changed. So 2 Corinthians, Paul says, listen, um, man, you guys are hitting on all kinds of cylinders. And then he can really begin to instruct them uh, in righteousness and, and holding the high ground for the cause of Christ. Galatians comes along and man, Paul said, listen, in Galatia, you guys were, you, you were unwell. Who has hindered you? from obeying the truth. And all of a sudden, salvation is not by grace alone, through faith alone. It's now through, quote unquote, salvation plus circumcision. And now you have to go back. You have to become a Jew to be saved and have to identify with the Jewish nation. And Paul tells the Galatians that salvation um, from the law of Moses and being saved through the law of Moses is false. No one can be saved by keeping the law. You're saved because Jesus fulfilled the law and he fulfilled it all. Ephesus comes around and man, Paul writes to Ephesus in uh, how to walk in grace, how to walk in peace, how to walk in love. It's just a beautiful, beautiful picture of walking in Christ. Philippians, um, how to have instructions, uh, how to have joy in Christ alone. I mean, man, this is Paul's uh, favorite church per se. Um, I mean, uh, Philippi supports him, his entire ministry, and he's writing to these guys from jail, talking to them about how to have joy in the person of Jesus Christ. Not on this time, we don't have time to do it, but I, I want to encourage you, if you really, if you really want to have a great study, I'm turning in my Bible to the book of Philippians right now, because I cannot remember how many verses the first chapter has, uh, but I'm going to give you a statistic that is very, very important for us to understand. In Philippians chapter 1, I'll get my eyes out here. I hadn't planned on doing this, but I think it's important to do. You have 30 chapters. If I remember correctly, and if you go back through each of the verses and just highlight where he talks about Christ or Jesus Christ. Can we have fun with this? Can we do this while you're watching on TV? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen times in thirty verses he talks about Jesus. You want to have joy in your life? Talk about Jesus. Make Jesus the central part of your life. And Paul says, even in prison, you can have a joy in Christ, a joy that is unspeakable and it is full of glory. Paul writes to Colossae and instructs the Colossians on not only who they are in Christ, but how to walk in Christ Jesus. Now, when Paul writes a little town called Thessalonica, the Thessalonians had some false teachers that came in there and started talking about the fact that there is no resurrection from the dead. And so in First Thessalonians chapter 4, man, we have the great passage about the rapture of the church. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those which have fallen asleep. And he goes through this whole thing about the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, dead in Christ are going to rise first. We who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to meet them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I mean, he just pours, he starts pouring this stuff on because the only way to combat false teaching is with truth. And he hits them with truth. Thessalonica is encouraged to excel in their faith, their hope, and their love because one day they're going to see their resurrected Savior face to face. And then in Second Thessalonians, there are instructions given to them on how to stand firm until the coming of Jesus Christ. Timothy, Paul writes his beloved son in the faith. He writes uh, in First Timothy to instruct Timothy on how to lead a church by by teaching and leading them by example and 
man, he writes him a second time and encourages Timothy to preach the word of God. Paul's getting ready to go off the scene and he understands it, but he believes that the church is going to be left in good hands because of the investment that he has made in young Timothy's life to preach the word of God. Timothy, do the work of an evangelist, he says. Preach the word of God with authority and share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ with every one you meet. Boy, then when you get this guy in the scripture, we don't preach out of his book a lot. We don't talk about him a lot. But man, is he one of Paul's favorites, a guy named Titus. Titus was, man, I'm telling you, if uh, he's probably the Isaiah of the Old Testament. When uh, the Cretes were having all kinds of problems, they were barbarians. Who did Paul send to Crete to straighten that mess out? Sent Titus. Titus would go on there, man, and, and, and kick people in the rear end, throw them out, and take names later. He's like, we're not having this kind of garbage. This is about Jesus, not about anything else. It's about him coming. And I mean, Titus was one of those guys. He, he, he taught Titus on advice on how to live and lead an, an orderly, um, countercultural church. Because, man, you talk about going into a barbaric society and telling them to love everybody. Gee, are you kidding me? The Cretes had thrown out about the last five, six pastors they had. Titus went in there and said, let me, boys, let me show, tell you. First of all, let me show you how to speak the truth in love. And let me tell you what love is, what love isn't. Love simply is this. We're going to tell you the truth and you're not going to be a pushover. But we're going to love you to Jesus and we're going to keep loving you to Jesus. It's an incredible book. Philemon is a story of a, a runaway slave who should be treated as a brother and not a slave. Great passage. You get a small little book. And Paul writes to um, Onesimus or Onesiphorus, one of those Ana guys, look it up in Philemon. Not many guys named Ani in the scripture, so just look him up. But understand, Paul says, listen, whatever he owes you, because this runaway slave had greatly, greatly um, inflicted pain upon his owner. Whatever he owes, Paul said, would you put it on my account? How much would he vouch for the guy? Put it on my account. All right. And then we get to what we call general letters in Scripture, the book of Hebrews. Uh, boy, the book of Hebrews is a great book because it represents Christ greater than anybody. And it starts with Abraham. It starts, well, it starts with angels first. Then it moves to Abraham, Moses, David. I mean, you go through all the patriarchs. Christ is greater than any of them. Christians should cling to Christ despite persecution because he is greater than anyone. James comes along and says Christians should live in ways that demonstrate their faith in action. And the great passages we have that faith without works is dead, James says. And as Christians, our faith should be seen in what we do, not what we talk about. Oh, it's a good, good, rich book. First Peter, uh, written to persecuted Christians, they're encouraged to testify about Jesus. Not only that, but the Live the truth of Almighty God. And then Second Peter reminds is a reminder of the truth of Jesus in the midst of horrific false teachers. There is truth. Keep your eyes on Jesus. False teachers will come. False teachers will go. But Jesus Christ alone is eternal. And then you get to three letters written by John. And John, uh, first John is a probably six chapters, if I remember correctly. Uh, Christians are to, to keep Jesus's commands. And more than anything, this is a book not only about loving one another, but about fellowship, that love, unbroken love relationship with Jesus Christ. Second John, listen, we're to walk in truth, love, and in obedience. And in John chapter three, it's about fellowship again and walking with Christ. Jude comes along and says, Christians are to be content for the faith and are to contend for the faith. Little play on words, but Jude is a powerful book. Again, as you can tell, the farther away we got from Christ, the more false teachers began to come on the scene. And Jude walks in and says, listen, um, there is truth. Keep teaching it. False teachers will be exposed for who they are. Talks about the heir of Balaam and the uh, teachings of Balaam, and it, it, he'll go through all kinds of things there, but pointing people back again to the truth found alone 
in Jesus Christ. And then you come to the book of prophecy. While several of the books of the New Testament focus some on prophecy, Revelation, that's the book. It tells us about, in your notes, the return of Christ. It tells us about the reign of Jesus Christ, secondly. It focuses upon the glory of Jesus Christ. And then in Revelation, we get the most detailed accounts of the future state of both believers and, yep, tragically, unbelievers and their eternal states. Now, Christ in the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament should be seen together as both portray Jesus Christ as the central figure. According to Luke 24, 27, Christ is seen in all the scriptures. In John chapter 5 and verse 39, Jesus said, the scriptures bear witness of me. And the key again is Jesus Christ. So let, let's have a little bit of fun with um, the, the Bible. And uh, as we look at it, we'll talk Old Testament, New Testament. The five books of what we would call the law, or better known as the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they focus on the promises of Christ and Christ's coming. Then you've got the history books, the poetry books, the the major prophets, the the minor prophets, which focused a lot on a prophetic message. They talk about the anticipation of Christ. They 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 talk about um, the different typology. In other words, Joseph was a type of Jesus Christ, and they could parallel things that took place in Joseph's of Joseph's life, and then show how those things were fulfilled in this man called Jesus. The anticipation of these things. Uh, Prophecy again, uh, especially on the tribulation, the millennial kingdom of Almighty God, but the central key being Jesus. The gospel, they talk about the manifestations of Christ. The the history book, uh, the book of Acts and the 21 lever, le, uh, letters, rather, they, they talk about the basically the church, the bride of Christ. Remember, this is new. Nobody in old knew about this thing that was getting ready to come until Jesus announced it uh, to Pete one day and said, upon this profession of faith, Pete, I will build my church. First mention of it. Nobody knew about it. The prophets diligently trying to figure out what was going to happen when the Messiah comes, the tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ. Something's got to take place. It all can't come about that quickly. Well, yeah, God had a plan. He just chose to do something unique. That's why the church, the bride of Christ, is neither Jew nor Gentile. It's neither male nor female. It's neither slave nor free, but we are all one body in Christ Jesus. We're a body. We're a family, a unit that is to work cohesively together. And then the book of Revelation, the book of prophecy, talks about the coronation, the crowning of this man called Jesus Christ. And you understand, Pilate got it right. This is the king of the Jews. One day he will be crowned as king of kings and lord of lords. And Paul, when he wrote to Philip, I said, there's coming a day when every knee will bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. You understand one day Satan will have to cower at the feet of Jesus and confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Ezekiel says this, the, the people that see this taking place, those that have said no to Jesus Christ and are going to way to everlasting punishment, Satan becomes a terror to them. They begin to tremble and say, is this the man that made kings tremble, who was so powerful, he's brought down to nothing just like we are. Remember, friend, he is but a roaring lion. He is not the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ, who's coming again, one day. Now, why is the Bible important? Let's answer that as we 
are working to bring this message to a close. What does 2 Timothy 3, 16 say about the Bible? Here's what it says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. A couple of weeks ago, I focused on those four things. Not going to do it now, but here's what the, that verse teaches us. The entire Bible is inspired by God. Man didn't write it. They wrote it as they were carried along, moved by the Holy Spirit. They were the scribe. The Holy Spirit was the author. And this word is said to be the mind of Christ. Dr. John MacArthur in his commentary on Second, uh, or on Second Timothy chapter 3 said this, So men were not inspired, but Scripture is. God breathed into them, and they wrote it down word by word, what God breathed into them. It was more than dictation. They weren't just listening to some voice and writing mechanically every word. It was flowing through their heart, their soul, their mind, their emotions, and their experiences. But it came out every word, the word of God. As God breathed into them the message and they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, they said it and some of them wrote it down. Miraculous, supernatural, inexplicable process that yielded to you and I the Word of God. Now, how do the following verses show the importance of God's Word? Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. We always focus on verse 16. Listen to verse 15. He's writing to Timothy. And verse 15 basically says the Scriptures are able to give wisdom that leads us to salvation. Listen to 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from a childhood, Timothy, You've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. So the Scripture alone leads us to salvation. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says this, For the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of the soul and the spirit of both the joints and the marrows, and is able, listen, note in your notes, to judge the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. That's how powerful this Word of God is, and it's what God's Word does for you and I. So why is it important? It is one that is able to expose to you and I the truth of our need for a Savior. Now, one more scripture. In Psalm 19 and verse 7, the scripture says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. What do those two verses tell us? Number one, it is God's word that restores the soul in Psalm 19.7. In verse 19.7, the second part, it makes wise the simple. In verse 8, it gives joy to the heart. And the second part of verse 8, it gives light to our eyes. As one writer in the Old Testament said it this way, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. One of the messages I've preached in years past is why the child of God should study the Word of God. Can I give you the number one reason? Because the enemy's read it. I can guarantee you he's read it. He's read it multiple times. He probably, friend, has it memorized because he has one thing that he always does with it. He distorts it. and he uses it to manipulate and or to control people. You need to study God's word so that you'll know the truth about how to get off of earth into a place called heaven. It's found through a man called Jesus. Now, Father, thank you for the message today. Thank you that your word, as we've surveyed the scriptures, your word is alive and it's powerful and it's still changing lives today. And Father, I do thank you that the message is simple. Jesus saves. And as we dive deeper now into this book, actually, how did we get it? How how was it compiled? All of those, sometimes what we would think detailed things, why were some books included? Why were some 
what people call books of the Bible, why were they excluded? Lord, as we dig deeper and we keep studying about this magnificent document we call the Bible, thank you, Father, that it changed my life, and I pray that it changes the lives of those who hear. Lord, my prayer is this morning, as Scripture exhorts us, not to be just a hearer of the Word, but to be a doer also. So, Father, help us to have our faith demonstrated by our actions and our behavior. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, Urban Crest. Let's represent him well this week. Man, that was a good word. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for helping us navigate that winding road to how we got the scriptures we have right now. Now, you guys, you know every week is Pastor Appreciation Week, so let's take a minute and let's just thank our pastor for the way he's been leading us. Um, Give him a big good word, a thank you. Love you, Pastor Tom. Great job. Let's just encourage him as he continues to encourage us. I'm gonna give you a few seconds. Do it now. All right, now at this point in the service, we wanted to offer you the opportunity to give. And you know, here at Urban Crest, we don't ask you for anything. We just want to encourage you to go to God in prayer and ask him how he would have you serve with your time, your talent, and your treasure. But we also like to encourage you by showing you what your giving is doing. Now, this thing is so near and dear to our hearts. We're talking about church planting. We love the churches that we help to plant, the brand new churches that we support, and you're about to hear from Pastor Sean of Life Church Monroe, who's one of our church planters and a beloved and dear friend. So I, I have nothing more to say. Take it away, Pastor Sean. Thanks, Jason, for that. And good morning, Urban Crest Church. It is so good to be with you today. Michelle and I and the family really do miss being with you. But we wanna to come today and thank you so much for your generosity and your giving. You see, in March, I was supposed to have my last day on staff at the end of March, and then we were supposed to begin the work here at Life Church Monroe in Monroe. And uh, one of the things that happened was because of COVID, all of our finances and fundraising efforts stopped. And we were about $3,000 short a month. And because of your giving, because of your generosity, Pastor Tom and the finance team were able to keep us on staff through the end of July. And what God did through that time was not only raise the rest of our funds, but he began to build our team. So this Sunday, we had over 50 people in our home as we're preparing to launch Life Church Monroe. And we believe that happened because of your giving. And so I wanna thank you again for your generosity. And I wanna thank you that you continue to blow my mind and give generously 
and that we could do the work because of what you've done. Thanks so much, Urban Crest, and it is good to be with you today. Man, I hope you guys are encouraged because I know I am. So God bless you guys as you're making those decisions. I hope you're making them prayerfully because it is so, so cool to get to see what is happening as a result of your generosity. So cool. Well, you guys, at this time, we got to let you go. It has been such an amazing time with you today. We hope to see you back here next week. But in the meantime, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell. It's that little bell shapey thing. Click that so that you know when we are online getting to do the amazing things we get to do with you. Again, we love you. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Bye.